So this is a, um, we're in a really cool section of the Bible today. Because a lot of what we've been talking about in this study that we've been doing to the church, right? We've been looking at everything that Paul has to say to the church. And here in chapter 4 in the book of Ephesians, he really turns and gives us practical application. And it is just going to be, today, it is going to be a ton of do this, don't do that. Do this, don't do that. And sometimes I think that's just fantastic for us because a lot of times we feel like, okay, like I get the whole justification by faith. I get the whole now I'm righteous, but like what does that actually mean like in my life? Like what does this mean for me? Like I don't, I don't need to, to hear the big thick stuff. I need you to tell me like how do I actually do this? Like God, what do you actually want from my life? And what's cool is Ephesians chapter 4 is like, you're going to get to the point where you're like, okay, that's good. No, no, don't keep going. I'm good. I'm good. And he just can, he will tell us verb after verb after verb after verb how to walk as a Christian. So if you wonder how in the world do I do this practically, Ephesians chapter 4 is awesome. It's also going to talk to us about how to walk as a church. So what does it look like for us to do church and how do we... How do we set it up and what should it look like and what is our role and what is our mission? And I think that this is just a really good chapter for us as we've been looking at that as a church. How do we walk this out as a group? What should we be like in the community? What should we be doing? What things should we focus on? And so the title of our time today is going to be Walk Worthy. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. He says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the calling which you were called. All right, so I'm gonna, we're going to get our blood flowing a little bit. So I want everybody to stand up. And I want to do one lap around this group of chairs right here. Just walk right around this group of chairs, okay? And then go right back to your seat. Just get a nice little stretch, get the legs moving, and walk around this group of chairs. Very nice. Come back to our seats. There we go. We got the blood flowing. Now we're feeling good. Walking is a verb, right? You go, Ben, why in the world did you have us walk? Well, what's awesome is, is that Paul is saying to the church, I want you guys to walk. It's interesting because a lot of times when the Lord tells us to do something, we do the opposite of what you guys just did. I just asked you guys to walk around the chairs and you were obedient. You said, sure. Okay, he tells me to do it, I'm going to do it. What's awesome is, is that that's what he's going to do with us tonight in this study. He's going to tell us to do things and what we have to do is we have to get up and we have to walk through them. We can't be ones that say, no, I'm sitting in my chair, bro. I came here to hear. I came here to sit. I'm not walking. I'm going to just say, plant it right here. What happens is, that's what, that's what happens all the time in our Christian walk. The Lord will nudge us. Don't do that. Walk in this. And a lot of times we go, no. But if we can do what you guys just did, when the Lord tells us to do something, like walk in this, if we can just say, all right, okay, babe, I don't know why Ben's telling me to go around some chairs, but okay, and back, and here we go. If we can do that when he says, I want you to do this and don't do this, well, we're going to be living out what he has called us to do as Christians. So let's go back and you could circle these words. Therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, I beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Walk worthy. We're going to get walk as a verb throughout chapter 4 and chapter 5. Now, if you also notice, what's the second word that we have in this chapter? I. Therefore, right? What have we learned about therefores? What is it therefore? What is it therefore? Okay, so, so, okay, so, so he's saying, he's building off of last Bible study. And what was last Bible study? It was this mysterious plan of bringing everything together. Okay, so what he's saying is there has been this mysterious plan that God has unfolded since the beginning of time of bringing the Jews and the Gentiles together. And he goes, now, now that you guys got that, now that you know there's no difference between Jew and Gentile, 
male or female, you guys are all in Christ together. Now, I want you to walk together. And I want you to walk it out together. So that's what our therefore is for. The prisoner of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the calling in which you were called. This is a pretty interesting and ironic thing. Because Paul is sitting here asking us to walk out our call. But Paul is physically and actually a prisoner at this point. He's writing this from jail. So just imagine, he is saying, I want you to walk out your calling. But he physically can't walk where he wants to walk at this point. But Paul's calling was to encourage and to build up the church. And so although he can't physically walk, he is walking out and walking worthy of his calling by writing. He is walking worthy of his calling by encouraging his brothers and sisters. It's impressive that Paul is able to encourage us in that, even when he's not able to walk. He goes on to say, walk worthy of the calling in which you are called. Calling is such an interesting thing. Because we can often get confused by it. You see, we have a calling as Christians. We have a calling as a church. And I believe that we all have a specific call within our own lives. As a Christian, there are certain things that you are called to do. Jesus said, therefore, go and make disciples out of all the world. Teach them the things that I have told you about. That's our calling as Christians. Everything that we do should be done in that light. That's our calling. When we're done with our job of that calling, Jesus will take us home. He's not going to leave us here any more than He needs to. Once our calling is fulfilled as getting the gospel out individually, He'll call us home. Our calling as a church, we're going to learn today, is to build each other up so that more people can come to know Jesus. That's our calling as a church. That's what we're supposed to do. But what's neat is that I believe that also individually, we all have a specific calling on our lives. There is something that Megan is called to do that I can't do. I get to see that because there's places that the Lord has burdened Megan that I can't go and I shouldn't go. But Megan has a calling to minister to women. I, I don't have that calling. It's a good thing that I don't have that calling, right? I have a calling to minister to men and to teach the Bible. I think that's my specific calling. I, if you put me in any situation, I will somehow just start teaching the Bible. It happens all the time. That's what, I, that's what I find most interesting. What I look on at different communities is, man, what would happen if the Bible was just taught? That's my heart. Not everybody is gifted or given that calling. But each one of us specifically has a calling. William Wilberforce has one of my most favorite callings of all time. He was called to take down slavery in Europe. It was a specific calling that the Lord had put upon his life. He spent his whole entire life fighting against the slave trade. And the week that he died, or the week before he died, slavery was abolished. That was his life's work to take that down. And I think that some of us have specific callings just like that. I love it because if you look at this chapter, you realize that it doesn't matter what Paul was doing. Even if he was in jail, he was going to walk out his calling. Now think about that. If you were taken and put into custody, would you still walk in the calling and walk worthy of the calling which God has called you to? Would it be so ingrained in you? This is what I do. This is who I am. That whether you're at a different vocation or whether you're in a different country, it doesn't matter where you're put, you're just going to consistently walk out your calling. You say, well, how do I know what my calling is? A lot of times we can ask ourselves certain questions like, what am I burdened for? What do you find yourself crying about? It's a good way to find your calling. If you are consistently upset at something, you, you can look on that and go, wow, the Lord... Maybe it's put this burden on my heart. If you look on at a community and something just breaks your heart, like when I see a place that doesn't have good Bible teaching, I go, man, I wonder what would happen if they had this. 
one of the reasons that we came back to Tiffin. We just looked on and my heart yearned to have a church in town that just taught the scriptures and that the, and that the church would then grow up and become mature Christians and just start living out their faith. It's a call that I believe that I have all my life. And what's cool is, what is what does God burden you for? The other thing that you can do is ask yourself is, what do I get incredibly excited about? What is it that you watch in movies that you just go, man, that gets me so pumped up? A lot of times you can look on at those things and go, okay, maybe there's something in there that the Lord has called me specifically to. Let's go on. He says, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So, what he's saying is, within this calling, there's a way that we should be. First, is that we should be lowly. And you could write next to lowly, humble. All right, it's wild that you think about. Jesus was lowly within his calling. In fact, in Psalm 22, it talks about that he was low like a worm. Now, this is the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. He had all power. He had all knowledge. And yet when he hung out with people, he was humble. Think about that. Think about that when the Pharisees came at him, and questioned him. He could have looked at them and said, I know every single thing about you. I know every single thing about you, Bob. I know what happened when you were five years old. I know what happened when you were seven years old. I know why you get so angry. I know why you feel rejected. I know the number of hairs that are on your head. You're going to sit here and question me? Let me tell you a little bit about you. You think that you're going to question me, bro? If I had been in Jesus' role, I would have. It would be like LeBron James coming in here and I challenge him to a basketball game. And I'm just like, I don't even know that it's LeBron. And I'm like, dude, you're going down. You don't even know. And I start doing this move. And he looks on and goes, are you for real? You're going to challenge me? You just did my move. Who do you think you are, right? We would look on and we would go, that is silly. But it would be like LeBron coming in with humbleness and going, all right, Ben, whatever, man. Let's just play a little bit. Maybe maybe I can teach you a few things. Maybe not. But he'll be humble about it. And that's the way that we're supposed to be in our calling. We don't always have to tell people when they're wrong. We don't have to try to correct people and everything. We serve humbly within our calling. Then he says, with gentleness. When I was chewing on these these verses, I thought, man, we could use some more gentleness. Can you imagine if we started treating each other with gentleness? If our politicians started treating other politicians with gentleness? If at work we started interacting with gentleness. I think of John, Pastor John Chinelli when I think of gentleness. I've never once heard him not say a gentle word. And I come at him with some crazy stuff. And every time, oh Ben, well tell me about this. Oh, okay. Okay, tell me about this. And, 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 and at times I look back at my conversations and I think, man, if I were Pastor John, I think I would have said to me at one point, dude, what are you thinking? But he never does that. One time when Pastor John was ministering to Megan and I, he had said something about trying not to say a negative thing about anybody the whole entire day. And he had, that was his challenge, is to never do that. And he goes about his work day, and he tries to never say a negative thing about people that he works with. He doesn't say a negative thing about his boss to his wife, even if he feels it. Man, that is super tough, isn't it? I would challenge you, can you make it through this day without not saying a negative thing about another person? It's gentleness. Do you look on and you go, I could, I could say that. I could tear this person down, my 
person that lives down the hall or my neighbor or the person that I work with. That's easy. Right? You can go on Twitter and just have a field day blowing people up. It's hard to be gentle. And that's what Paul's encouraging us to do. He goes, it's, this is hard with all gentleness. But he doesn't stop there. He says with long-suffering. Or you could write next to long-suffering patience. I've said this before. I think long-suffering is one of my favorite verbs of the Bible that I've been growing and loving in is suffering through things with people. When we have difficult people in our lives, the Lord is asking us to suffer along with them. But then He says... I want you to bear with one another in love. As Christians, we should be bearing through things with one another because we love each other. And then he says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There's only a couple times where he uses the word unity in the New Testament, and this is one of those places. And when he talks about unity, he's talking about the church. Kind of a cool thing there and tough for us to think about. Because what we tend to do as the church, now remember, we're specifically talking about Christians. We're specifically talking about the church here. We're not talking about all of human race. We're talking about, he's saying, you guys, this is the church. You need to be unified. What that means is that's us in grace. That's us in family of faith. That's us in the other Bible-believing churches that are in Tiffin. We should not look on at each other and go, you're competition. I was joking this last week that when we redid our website, there was a guy that had asked us about Calvary Tiffin. He wanted information. And at one point in the questionnaire, it said, who is your competition? And I put the enemy and he said, no, seriously, like, who's your competition? Like, what churches do you compete with? And I said, the enemy. That is our competition. I'm not going to put some other church that's on here. It's just not, we're not going to do that. Why? Because it's, it's putting a wedge in between us. Grace and family of faith and these other churches, they're just different flavors. Okay, there's, there are churches that are, and we'll talk about this in a minute, that are evangelical gifted. Okay, their heart is to go out and get people that don't know the Lord and to bring them in. Now, folks that have a heart for that should be in those types of churches because that's what they love. Okay, there's some churches where the worship, they play tambourines and they, and they play different musical instruments and they jump and they shout and they have big choruses. You know who should be at those churches? The people that love tambourines and jumping and shouting and big choruses. There are some churches that like to just teach the Bible. Do you know who should be a part of those churches? People that want to hear from the Bible. We're different flavors. We're not in competition. And we can't look at each other and get upset if somebody leaves and goes to another one. Because maybe that's their flavor. Because we have to be unified. There are different times that something happens within one of our brother and sister churches. And we'll reach out to them. We're praying for you guys. I I would love today if we could be with Pastor Phil and Family of Faith. I've been walking with Pastor Phil. We basically came to Tiffin at the same time. Super excited for that guy. And we, we rejoice with them today. We don't look on it as, man can't believe that they're doing, I, oh my goodness, did you see this new, no, we, we're not even going to go there. Why? Because we need to be unified. We need to be unified within the body. <clears throat> we need to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, that unity, we strive for it, but it's the Holy Spirit that keeps it together. It's not our job to keep the church together. It's not even ours. It's Jesus' church. He's in charge. He's got it all together. Our job is just to endeavor. And then it says, For there is one body, one spirit, just as we are called in, one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. 
As we're together, one body, one spirit, one hope of our calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Now there's some scholars that look on at the one baptism, and that's where they disagree with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. For the next two minutes, I'm going to go into the Holy Spirit. If it's a little bit confusing, just ask afterwards. Okay, there's different scholars that look on at baptism with water and baptism of the Holy Spirit and say that they happen at the same exact time. Okay, so we realize that once we are saved, we give our lives to Jesus, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. Now, there's some scholars that look on and say the Holy Spirit fills you at that point. There's others like us that we look on and we see two experiences that happen. Okay, we see being saved by the Holy Spirit and then we see being baptized by the Holy Spirit. Now, if you look at the Gospel of John, how it ends in the book of Acts, you see the believers, Jesus breathes on them the Holy Spirit. And at that point, they are saved. Right? The Holy Spirit is sealing them. Then we see Pentecost happen where the Holy Spirit comes upon them. And then we see them starting to do these miracles and Peter starts teaching and thousands come to the Lord. So we see two experiences happen. That's what happened in my life. Now those can happen at the same exact time. So going through this, just helping to understand because people that look on at us and go, two baptisms? No. Ephesians chapter 4 says one baptism. Well, we're not talking about water baptism here. We're talking about coming into the faith together. Okay, remember, Jesus went through baptism, water baptism, but he did it differently than we did because we did it to show that we are publicly following him, that our sins are now forgotten. Jesus didn't have to do that. You go, well, then why was Jesus baptized? Well, it's because he was coming into and leading the body. Okay, and so that's the baptism. We're not talking so much about a water baptism. It's almost like a grouping together. That's what we mean here when we say one baptism. Then it says, But to each of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led the captive, captivity captive and gave men gifts and gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended. What does it mean? But that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is also one who ascended far above the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to be a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up in all things into whom is the head Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by, by, whatever, by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Point number two tonight. Point number one was walk worthy of our calling. Point number two is walk as the church in our giftings. So first off, we have these spiritual gifts. Now what's kind of cool is that Paul adds in this little nugget about Jesus, he ascended. But then he does this little thing where he talks about if he ascended, that means that he had to descend. What's cool is that he's sharing that Jesus came from heaven down to earth. And then he went back up. And he uses this verse from the Old Testament to say, <clears throat> from Psalm 68, 18, When he ascended on high, he led the captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Okay, so Jesus went down, caught all the saints that had been waiting, and when he brought them back up, he then gifted with his gifts. 
Then it says in verse 10, He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. So you could circle or underline all, and the meaning of that word all means all. It means every single place. The reason that he descended and ascended was that everybody would come to know about Jesus Christ. Verse 12 is going to be the key verse, I think, in the book of Ephesians. I go to verse 12. Because not only is it the key book in the book of Ephesians, I think it's the key verse to the church, and it's the key verse to us as Calvary Chapel Tiffin. It says, For the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. You could circle that or underline that because that is our job. What? Um, Point two is walk as the church in our giftings. Now what's cool about this is that this is the verse that Pastor Chuck had on his heart when he put together Calvary Chapel. Pastor Chuck had started his ministry as he thought he was an evangelist. And he would preach all of these evangelical types of sermons. He would do altar calls at the end. And nobody was coming forward. And he got upset. And he looked on at the people that were in his church and he was thinking, why didn't you bring your neighbors and your friends? The sinners. Bring the sinners. Look at me. I'm up here preaching these unbelievable evangelical messages and you guys are all saved. He got really frustrated. And then he got to Ephesians chapter 4 and he realized... His job was not to be an evangelist. His job was to be a pastor teacher. And what he realized was verse 12 is the job of the church. The job of the church is to edify or to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So as we're going to go back to these titles or these giftings, understand that the job of these people is to build up the church. That is my job. My job is to equip you guys and to build you up so that you will become mature in your faith and that you will naturally become an evangelist. That you will naturally just start sharing the word because you're in love with Jesus. And that's how we have set up our church. That's how Calvary Chapel Tiffin is set up. We don't do billboards. We don't do handouts. We look at it as... If we're just being Christians, we're naturally going to start sharing the gospel. And we'll be able to know how effective we are by if we're inviting people. If not, that means that we need to build up. So let's go back. Because he says in verse 11, here's the things, the giftings of the church. And this is how the church should be set up with different roles. He says, first, you've got to have apostles. Now, the apostles were those that started the work. They were foundational workers. Some people look on and still believe that there's apostles today. As we study the word, I don't think that it means that. I think that the apostles were foundational workers to set the, the first round of stones for the church. The apostle Paul, the apostle Peter. Part of that was they had to see Jesus. And the work that they did was so important, it was foundational. That's where we get this from. That was the work of the apostles. Now, if somebody comes up to you and says, my name is Apostle Jerry, or you know something, probably have a little bit of a difference of belief in what we believe that apostles are. Apostle also means one that is sent. So some people believe that missionaries are apostles. Church planners are apostles. I just look on and I go, "Hmm." when we read the scriptures, it doesn't really look like that still applies. It's a foundational work. The best way that I can understand it was Pastor Chuck started a foundational work with Calvary Chapel. And and we don't need to go and start something new. There's no need to. We can build off of what he did. We're building off a stone that he laid. He's already put together the way of doing church that we like. And so we're then able to say, we're just going to be a stone on top. 
That's how it is with the original apostles. They have laid these stones for us. We don't need any more doctrine. It's all right here. And we can go back to the book of Ephesians, just like we've been doing the book of Romans, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, and go, how do we do church? Like this. We don't need to write new books. It's already been written. When we talk about church planning, we go to the book of Acts, because it's already been done. Now the next ones, I do believe, are still active in the church today. Next it says, And he himself gave some to be apostles and some prophets. Now a prophet is somebody that speaks directly on behalf of God. Let me let you guys in on a little secret. We believe that on Sunday mornings when we get here and do this, that there are times that I am becoming a prophet. You go, wait a minute, you're a prophet? That's part of what we believe happens here at church. That's why that this is a holy space. That's why we don't just let anybody come in and do it. Because why? This is a very specific place for us to hear from God. Now, I am not the type of person that is going to come out and read the scriptures. I am a pastor teacher, which we'll get to in a minute. But I go to the Lord and I seek Him. What do you want to say to our group? What is it that you're putting on our hearts? In this chapter today, what is it that I can't miss? Oftentimes I'll say, Lord, help me to get out of the way. I want you to speak. Part of being a prophet. Now some people have that gifting where they can just basically say, thus says the Lord. And you've got to be careful with it because a lot of times that gets hijacked. All right? There are people that have the gift of prophecy. There are people that do not have the gift of prophecy, but think they have the gift of prophecy. And so our job is to just check it. I often share, one time when I was at the Lima YMCA, there was a guy that came in and said he was a seer. A what? It was an Old Testament term for somebody that sees pictures. And he did this whole thing where he said, basically went around to all the guys that were in this circle. He says, this is what I see. And this is what the Lord is speaking into your life. And he spoke to the guy next to me. Or he might have been a couple down. And he said something about, like, your ministry is going to blow up. I can see it happening. And this is what's going to happen. And this and that. And the dude, after he gets all this, he says, I accept that. And I've often thought, what if he didn't say that? What if he would have been like, bro, your ministry's going down. And I know what's secretly going on in your life. Because all of it was super positive, right? But what if he would have said, thus says the Lord... I see what's going on here. Would he still have said, I accept that. He came to me and he said something and he said, you know, I see this going on in the place that you're, I, this is when I was leaving the Y to come work at Tiffin University and he spoke this into my life and it sounded super cool. Right here, there's warriors that are going to be raised up. And I thought to myself, it's cool, but I'm not sure that's from the Lord. It sounds very encouraging, and so I sought the Lord. Now there wasn't anything different than I hadn't already heard from the Lord. So we have to be like the Bereans and go, okay, does that line up? One time at Calvary Chapel, Fort Lauderdale, we had a very tough time that we went through. And the pastors wanted to hear what the Lord was speaking to the church. And so they would have these meetings, these prayer worship meetings, and they would say, if you hear a word from the Lord... Come. And what they did was they had all of these people. We had 20, 30,000 people in our church. So what they did was they took all of that and then they started looking for themes. Because some of people, it might have just been the pizza that they had had the night before. And they're like, man, this is what I'm thinking. So we have to be able to take that and go, okay, if you're a prophet, if you are speaking on behalf of the Lord, I need to make sure that I'm not getting duped. Because it's awesome to hear from the Lord. And it's awesome when people say something and thus says the Lord and it is from the Lord. But we also have to be checking and making sure, is that from the Lord or is that from Tony Robbins? Because I want what the Lord has. And I can't be duped. And so we have to be careful with prophets. <clears throat> prophets are very important to the church, let me just say. It is awesome whenever we're, we're able to hear from the Lord. He says next, some are given to be evangelists. It's important to have evangelists. Some people are gifted in different types of evangelical ministry. 
Billy Graham had a very different calling than I do. I'm not gifted that way. I could never get up on a stage in front of 40,000 people and lay out the gospel like that. He had a different gifting. But here's the thing. My style of of evangelizing is one-on-one. I'm a lot different one-on-one than I am to a group of people. That's why we don't do too many altar calls here. It's not... It's not really up my alley. Some people are, are, Pastor Jerry is very good at throwing a net, a big, large net of evangelism. He can just pull people to the Lord. He's gifted in that way. And we need those in the church. We had a guy that we went to church with and we were baptizing people down at the beach. And he was talking about evangelism. And he goes out and he evangelizes here and evangelizes there. And he talked about that somebody had said to them about, have you started a Bible study with them, with these guys that you're bringing to the Lord? And he goes, no, I don't want anything to do with that. I just want to evangelize to them. And I looked on, and I was like, that's the most important part. What are you talking about? But look at how we work together. He goes and he brings them in, and then he brings them to somebody else that goes, you have to teach them. And that's the church. All right, next it says, some are given to be pastors and teachers. Now, I understand this one really well, because that's where I'm at. I think that this is the most important thing that we could do within the church. That's why we're part of Calvary Chapel. We believe that the biggest need in the church today is teaching of the Word of God. Because if we can do that, if we can focus on just teaching the Word of God, what we believe happens is, that you guys will be built up, you will be equipped, and then you will go out. We won't have to look at things like programming, and should we do this, and should we set up these invitation days. We believe that if we are growing and maturing in our faith, we will naturally just start inviting people. That we will look on at our neighbor that is struggling within their marriage, and we will just naturally start to minister Come to our church. Next week, we're going to be talking about parenting and we're going to be talking about marriage. The beautiful thing about going through the Word is that you know that if somebody comes in here, they're going to be ministered to because we're going to open the Bible every single Sunday. And what's going to happen is as we start to grow in our faith, we're going to realize that that's where the power is. I've noticed in ministry, when I share something that's like my wisdom Usually, nothing changes. But when I share the Word of God with somebody, and they start applying it to their lives, what's wild is that things start to change. Pastors and teachers, evangelists, prophets, as we work together, we are becoming the church. Look at what it says in verse 13. Till we all come to the unity of the faith of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up in all things into him who is the head of Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by whatever joint supplies, according to the effect of working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Notice that it doesn't say that as you grow in the Lord, the storms will go away. Once you become a Christian, everything will get better. It doesn't say that. Go back to verse 13. Or I'm sorry, verse 14. It says that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried away with every wind of doctrine. So what happens is, as we start getting into our faith and we start learning more and more and more, we start realizing That we don't need to be tossed to and fro. We don't get beat up in the storm anymore. Because we're starting to understand the ways of God. We're starting to understand why He does things and how He does things. And so it's not just that. 
but it's also that we're not going to be taken away by every wind of funky doctrine. What tends to happen is funky doctrine comes through a town just like in waves. And people, if they don't know the Word of God, can get carried away. Listening to a guy that had a very large ministry, and he did this thing where he would call demons out of people. And he would have them blow their nose, and that was like the demon going out, right? And at one point, somebody had interviewed this guy, and he said, yeah, that was really just a show. I wanted to teach the Word of God, But to get people to come, I had to do something crazy. So I would do this whole demon thing. He goes, but my heart was just to teach the Word of God. I thought, man, isn't that crazy? That we as people, will follow that garbage, right? What? I've often, our pastor used to say, how crazy is it that arenas get filled to go and watch a wrestling match where it's already been put together the storyline has already been done he goes it's crazy that people will go and watch wwf or wwe it's fake right and now they might be doing the moves but it's they already know the outcome what he would say is that it's not hard to gather a crowd we'll go and watch demons get blown out of noses but he had to do that because people didn't want to just sit here and study the word of god they would go for the emotional side of it they would go for the show we can't do that. We can't get carried away by, oh my goodness, this, this place has lights and smoke and this place has this and this place has that. No, no, no. Because we can get carried away by marketing. But we need to be strong in our foundation. He then says, but speak the truth in love. May that we grow up into all things, into Him who is the head of Christ. And then it says that we will be knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by every part does its share. When the church starts working together, guys, we're just going to automatically start being knitted together and we're going to do our share. Beautiful picture of the community church, isn't it? That we look on and we say one person, not only can they not do it, they're not supposed to do it. There are certain things that Megan does here at Calvary Tiffin that I just, I could not do and I do not see. She is gifted in so many ways. And she, she sees things differently than I do. When we set up children's ministry, she'll look at it and say, mm, no, we should do this. Same exact thing with Trisha and with Dominic. They, they look on and they see things totally different and I, and I can't. But what's awesome is, is that when we start digging in together, well, now we're becoming the church. It naturally says in verse 16 that what will happen is when we do this, it will cause growth of the body for edifying of itself in love. So when we start working together as a group, what's naturally going to happen is we're going to be knit together We're going to grow, and it's going to happen because we're in this thing for love. And then it says in verse 17, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their hearts, who being past feelings have given themselves over to lewdness, To work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard Him who has been taught by Him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness." He does this really neat thing where he contrasts the old man and the new man. And that's your life before Jesus and your life after Jesus. He then says in verse 25, Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. Be angry. Do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. 
Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give to him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Paul is encouraging us to walk personally and as the church. And he shares what we should do, and he shares what we shouldn't do. Isn't that incredibly practical? As he goes through and he says, do this, don't do this. It says that those that walk away from God will consistently lose their understanding and they will start walking further and further away from God. How sad is that? It says as you just start to walk away from the Lord, you're just going to get darker and darker and darker. Your knowledge of Him is going to get even more and more dim. But verse 20, it says that we need to hear Jesus and we need to be taught by Jesus. It says in the Gospel of John, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in My name, He will teach you all things, and bring to you your remembrance all things that I said to you. And what does that mean? It means that you don't need another teacher. There's something that happens after Jesus rose from the grave and the Holy Spirit then came down. We have the ability to have the Holy Spirit inside of us. And that means that He's the one that can teach us. Once I learned that the Holy Spirit can be my teacher, I didn't count on other earthly teachers as much. Warren Wiersbe is one of my favorite Bible teachers. Chuck Smith is one of my favorite Bible teachers. But there is nothing compared to the Holy Spirit speaking His Scripture into your life. That's what happens when we study our Bibles. Guys, I'm telling you, there are repeatedly days where I will get up and I will read my Bible and it will be something that He will speak into Megan or I's life. Or I'll see something happen at work and I'll go, I read that in my Bible this morning. Warren Wearsby can't do that for me. But the Holy Spirit knows everything about me. He knows exactly what I'm going through. He knows what my obstacles are tonight, tomorrow morning. And so once we get into His Word, He'll speak to us. And what happens if we don't hear from the Holy Spirit? Well, we don't have guidance. And we don't have direction. And we don't get that encouragement. And we get to the point where we grow further and further and further away from the Lord. And we crave encouragement. And we crave direction. Right? All the time. What do we say? Lord, what what do you have for me? What's my purpose? What's your will in my life? All the time we say that. The way that we find it out is that we spend some time here. I think that we should spend as much time as we can. Because once we hear from the Lord, then we'll know our direction for the day. You go, well, man, I don't know how to study the Word. Where do I start? Start at the Gospel of John. Read one chapter a day. Go all the way through. And once you get done, read it again. And you get to the point where, okay, I'm ready to move on to the next book. Okay, move on. Where do you want to go? Go to Acts. Read about the church. You could start in Proverbs. There's 31 Proverbs. You can do one every single day of the month. So you can wake up today is the 6th. You read Proverbs chapter 6. And you do that until you go, okay, I need something else. Start in the very beginning. Genesis chapter 1. Well, what do I do? You read it. Even to Leviticus? Yeah, go all the way through Leviticus. Numbers, Deuteronomy, all the way to the book of Revelation. And then once you get to Revelation, go all the way back to the beginning. Start again. Because what happens is when you read Genesis all the way to Revelation, you get the full counsel of God. He's going to tell you every single thing that you need to know. And if it's not in there, you don't need to know it. 
It's the beauty of studying the Word of God is that He has everything that you're going to need right in here. It also says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit with whom you are sealed. What's important about that is that we're, what He's saying is, once you get saved and the Holy Spirit starts speaking into your life, don't do that. What, is it, what did He say in there a couple times? Don't be angry, but don't sin. Don't steal. Do something good with your hands. Give. Serve. Get rid of bitterness. Get rid of wrath. Get rid of anger. Get rid of clamor. Get rid of evil speaking. Malice. What happens is the Lord comes into our lives. And we say something bitter. We say something angry. And the Holy Spirit goes, you don't have to say that anymore. You're a believer in Jesus. You don't have to be bitter. You're going to heaven. Forgive them. And if we go, no, I don't want to forgive. What happens is we start to grieve the Holy Spirit. And we start to become further and further away. What Paul is saying is don't do that. The Holy Spirit is really good. It's trying to clean you. Trying to make you better. Instead, verse 32, and here's some practical things that you can do this week. Be kind to one another. Be tender hearted. Forgive one another even as God in Christ forgave you. Chapter 5, Therefore be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love. Underline walk. As Christ also loved us and gave Himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma, Aroma, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you, as is fitting for the saints, neither filthiness nor foolishness, talking nor coarse gesturing, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, no covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be takers with them. Next point is walk in love. He gives us another therefore, right? He starts chapter 5, therefore. He's saying now, you guys as the church, you guys as Christians, now that you know to start walking, here's how I want you to walk. I want you to walk in love. He says, be imitators. Now, although we cannot be God, we can strive to become more like Him. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15 and 16 says, As He who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is, it is writing, be holy, for I am holy. He says, walk in love. Now, you can underline the word love, and it's the agape. Remember that there's different words for love. There's the love that's like, I love pizza. There's the different love that's like, I love the Pittsburgh Steelers. And there's the love that is, I love Jesus. Now those are three totally different things, aren't they? I would not die for a piece of pizza. I would not die for the Pittsburgh Steelers. I would die for Jesus. I love my wife. I agape love my wife, Megan. I would die and lay down my life for Megan. I would not do it for the Pittsburgh Steelers. They don't. We're not there. Right? There's a difference of that type of love. He goes, walk in love. Not pizza love. Not stealer love. But the life-giving, sacrificial love. Look at the contrast of walking in love. He goes, now this is the opposite of walking in love. And he names three things. He says fornication, uncleanness, and covetousness. Now next to fornication, you can write porneia. Okay, that's the Greek word that is used there. It's a very broad word having to describe sexual sin. That's where we get our word pornography from. He says, don't do it. (coughs) Stay away from it. Uncleanness. Now, I'm going to mispronounce this one, but it's akrathatos, A-K-A-T-H-A-R-T-O-S. Okay, that's a broad word for not clean in a ceremonial sense. 
We need to abstain from immoral behavior. Okay, so stay away from uncleanness. Stay away from fornication. Stay away from covetousness. Right next to that, you can write plantacaeus. That means one eager to have more what belongs to another. Don't covet things that aren't yours. Stay away from them. Now what's interesting is that those three things are the opposite or the contrast of love. Fornication is actually contrast of love. Now a lot of times we confuse it because we think that sex is love. The problem is is that when it's not in God's confines, it's actually against love. And it's tough because we live in a society that says, do whatever you want. And sex is love. Love is love. No, God is love. And we need to disconnect to those things. When we are committing sexual sin, we're actually hurting not only ourselves, but we're hurting the other person. Can you imagine if within the church, when we started getting to the point where People are crossing the line. If we could shut it down and realize, okay, think about a person that has an affair. Okay, a husband and a wife over here, and then one of them starts flirting with this person. We tend to think that this is some crazy form of love that's happening. It's not. It's hateful. Okay, what's going to happen is both of these families are going to be torn apart. Okay, that act is not loving. That act is actually hurting the person. And so we need to look at sexual sin just like that. Okay, it's, it's hurting not only me, but it's hurting you. He says, stay away from those things. Uncleanness, stay away from it. Covetousness, don't, don't covet things that aren't yours. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And then he ends it by saying, don't be deceived. Don't try to convince yourself that sexual sin's okay. Don't try to convince yourself that something unclean is okay. Don't try to convince yourself that covetousness is okay. Listen, we covet all the time within our society. That's why we're all in debt. Because we want things that we can't afford. If you have the money to buy something, go ahead and buy it. But when we look on at something and we go, man, I want it so badly, but we don't have the money to pay for it, it's coveting. We look on at somebody else's family and we go, I want that. It's coveting. He says, stay away from it and don't be deceived. Verse 8. He says, for you once, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Underline walk. For the fruit of the Spirit is all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful to even speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Point number four is walk in the light. Verse 11 is an interesting one because he says, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Fellowship, koinonia, that's a Christian word. That means when we hang out, that's called fellowship. When Christian people get together and hang out, that's our word. That's what that word means. What's awesome is he says, have no fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. And this is where we sometimes get tripped up as Christians. Okay, there are people that believe, I need to be with the darkness, because if I'm not with the darkness, then they're never going to come to the light. And that's where people get themselves in trouble. I can go to bars. Who's going to save all those people that are at the bars if I'm not there? Sometimes we get ourselves into a problem of, bro, it's one thing to go and evangelize at a bar, but you're tipping like 10 back. I don't know that that's light. What happens is, sometimes we go into those places with good intentions, but we get ourselves in trouble. When I was young in my faith, and one of my struggles was pornography, I started to realize that there's a group of people that ministers to porn stars. 
They go to these porn conventions like there was in Miami, and they take these Bibles in that say, Jesus loves porn stars. And they would go in, and where all these booths were set up, there would be these Christians. And there's these porn stars that have been coming to know the Lord. And at one point, I thought, this is it. This is my calling. And then I started to realize that I struggled with even knowing these porn stars because I knew them from my past. And I was having trouble because I was feeling like I'm going to get caught up. Megan and I talked it through. We had one pastor from our church that went and ministered to this. And I thought to myself, if I go there, I'm going down. I talked to Pastor Jerry about it. I said, man, I think it's a super cool ministry. But there's no way I could do that. And I got myself distant from it. I couldn't even look at the testimonials of the porn stars that had given their lives to the Lord. I struggled with where my mind would go. I can't go into that darkness. He's going to need to send somebody else. And so we need to keep a safe distance. Like he says in verse 11, have no fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. This ministry would go in and expose what was happening. They weren't going in there to get to know the people. Jesus went into darkness to pull people out. A lot of times people will say that. Well, Jesus, Jesus would be the guy that would go to the bar. He always hung out with sinners. And Jesus would go in and he would pull people out. We need to protect ourselves in these situations. Let's move on. This is where we end. <clears throat> Verse 15. He says, See that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dispensation, but be filled with with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord, giving thanks always for the things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submit to one another in the fear of God. Last point is walk in wisdom. Walk in wisdom. There's a lot that we covered today. There's a lot of do's and there's a lot of don'ts. And you're going to have to figure out what that looks like in your life. That group that went into the porn industry, they were called to that. There was a specific calling on their lives. And not everybody can do that. There are people that are called to all kinds of different ministries and we need to be wise about those things. We need to go and seek the Lord in His Word. Lord, what are you calling me to? I like what it says in verse 17. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. The way that we understand God's will for our lives is to be in His Word. We feel like, okay, Lord, are you leading me here? Is this your calling on my life? We need to confirm it in His Word. When we ask the Lord to confirm things to us from His Word, it is something that we can stand firmly on throughout the rest of our lives. The calling that I have on my life, it came from Scripture. At one point, I was starting to feel like, Lord, I feel like You're calling me to something. I don't exactly know what it is. So for the very first time in my Christian walk, I fasted. I don't know what this looks like, Lord. But I'm going to not eat. And I was really hungry. And instead of eating, I opened my Bible and I started digging in. I still have the Bible. And I have the date written next to the text. It was in the book of Jeremiah. He spoke into my life what he was going to have me do. Now, there's different times where I feel discouraged in my walk. I feel discouraged in my call. Whenever that happens, I'll go back to those verses. Because that's what He spoke into my life. When we came and started the church here, it wasn't necessarily because we wanted to. At one point, we didn't want to come. I didn't want to come back to Tiffin. He gave us verses. So that when things get difficult, we go back to those verses and we go, okay, you've called us to this work. We have Scripture. 
And so whatever it is in your life, whatever it is that you're, you're looking to go to next, ask the Lord to give you Scripture and be wise. Verse 18, do not be drunk with wine, in which is dispensation, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. I love that section. As a guy that used to struggle with alcohol, I love that he says, you don't need to be drunk with wine. You can be filled with the Holy Spirit. Are you serious? This is awesome. Now, it doesn't mean that we look on and say that all alcohol is bad. In my life, I don't like to drink because I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I know what happens. I have a, I have a years and years and years of what happens to me when I drink alcohol. I don't want anything to do with it. I love looking at what happens in my life when I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. He says, speak to one another in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. That's how we're supposed to talk to one one another. We should be giving thanks always for the things to God, the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You can start that in the morning. Lord, thanks. Thanks for waking me up. Man, I just breathed like three times. Every single one of those breaths came from you. Lord, I love bagels. Man, that's so cool. You didn't have to come up with bagels. Oh, this co- this coffee is so good, Lord. I don't know what it is about coffee beans, but I'm glad that you brought them up. My favorite color is orange. I love orange. And you didn't have to create orange. You could have just created blue and red. You could have hung out in the pink world, but you gave us orange, red and yellow. What a cool combination, Lord. If we can get ourselves in that type of a mindset, that's what Paul is talking about. Lord, look at this fellowship that you brought together. At one point, we weren't even here. We were all in different places. But in the middle of Tiffin, you started bringing people together. Ah, this is cool, Lord. At one point, we were in our house. We were in a living room. Now we're in a space. The YMCA has provided this for us. And they love it. And they pray with us through these things. How cool. I don't know if they pray with us through it, but I know that they're excited for us to be here. We can be thankful about the things that the Lord is doing. And then it says, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Next week, we'll talk about what that practically looks like. We'll talk about marriage. We're going to talk about what family should look like, children and parents. So read ahead. There's, there's two things that I want you to try to find. Actually, three for next week. Number one, what is Paul encouraging wives to do? Number two, what is Paul encouraging husbands to do? And then number three, what is Paul encouraging children to do? All right, that's your your homework for this week as you read Ephesians chapter 6. This is a cool little text for us as a church, isn't it? 